Well, I was essentially out of it as a teenager until I discovered um, beatnik, beatnikery, and uh, that sort of saved uh, that sort of saved my adolescence. Um, you know, the kids that ran the school, the the, the 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 heroes, the ones that everybody wanted to be like, the popular ones were these were these crew cut uh, football players, and their and their cheerleader girlfriends, and that was the that, that was the oppressive hierarchy that that dominated everything and then uh, then when we discovered um, Allen Ginsberg and and jazz and black people and stuff like that um, we carved out our own little uh, empire it was a way of rebelling yeah it was a way of well the, well the big word then was uh, conformity um, that was one of the great threats um, Everybody was worried about conformity, and everybody was, and, 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 and then, and then, so you wanted to become a, a nonconformist. You knew that a certain kind of shirt that uh, that that all the other guys wore, uh, that had a button here and a button here and another button back here, that that was the kind of shirt that you were supposed to wear. Um, you knew that a certain the certain details of haircut. Um, you were supposed to have uh, whether you had a little wave that went up here like that, or whether you had a flat top, whether your hair was cut square. Um, th there were all these ways of being, uh, or not all of these, there were actually very few. Um, you knew what they were. Um, you knew you weren't supposed to be a brain. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet you also knew that there was something uncool about, about, uh, about all this. I mean, this was a period, we're talking about a period when, um, when the idea of mass bohemia had not been invented, when, when, um, uh, when, when there, wasn't, um, there wasn't a mass rebellion. There was a kind of a, uh, there, was a, there, was a there was a quiet resistance to a great, huge, bland, um, uncooked muffin of a culture. Uh, that in, that included um, that included Eisenhower and everything that Eisenhower represented, all of this sort of blandness and, and prayer breakfasts and and uh, civic pieties and reassurances that America was the greatest, and uh, all of this all of this uh, uh, all of this great bland piety uh, that was that was just kind of sitting there inertly. And um, it was incredibly boring, and so the the, the rebellion was a, was as much as anything else a rebellion against this this just stupefying boredom that was the official uh, official everything of the time. The ideal, the sort of male ideal at the time, was the Charles Atlas advertisement. Was the was this huge, muscular, pumped up kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger creature. And if you didn't have these huge muscles, then then you were you know a 97 pound weakling and an object of, of uh, an object of contempt. So when the Beatles came along and they were kind of skinny, and, and yet uh, the girls liked them, this was a gigantic liberation for all the sort of skinny guys in the world. And um, uh, but the, this didn't really exist. At this didn't really exist in the in the mid 50s and late 50s. Except in some of these marginal worlds, like uh, like the ja like the world of jazz, uh, the world of beatniks, um, that sort of thing. We had a young teacher uh, when I was in the eleventh grade, a kind of a charismatic young teacher, and he assigned us Catcher in the Rye, and uh, uh, which which we we just devoured. I mean, this was a book that really spoke to us. And then one day, the principal came into the class and had us all pass up our copies of Catcher in the Rye and told us to forget that we'd ever seen this book. And uh, we learned fairly quickly that this had been, that the book had been banned by the school board. And uh, this was such a, this was such a, uh, uh, this turned out to be a real learning experience <laughs> for all of us because uh, far we learned a lot more than we would have learned if we'd just been allowed to read the book because this way, of course, not only did we read the book, but everybody in the school suddenly wanted to read the book. In fact, uh, my friends and I went to New York, bought 
um, cartons of the book and sold them right outside the school grounds. Because suddenly all of these thick-necked uh, jocks, you know, wanted to read, what's that, you got that Catch and Arrive book? Eh? You got it? I hear that's really, uh, you know, hot stuff. My favorite teacher in high school, the head of the English department, uh, and, and his, he taught the senior honors class, and the big, the big thing uh, every year for him was that he taught Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. That was the kind of high point of the year, of senior year in English. Well, that book got banned by the school board, and there was an enormous fight over it, and, uh, and it was kind of my first experience with this sort of rebellion and political political, a kind of political rebellion, where I didn't, I, I did feel I, that I had adult allies. You know, we all wore black armbands to school to show, to protest uh, the banning of this book. Um, and it was just a wrenching, wrenching experience for, uh, for this teacher whom we loved so much, you know, who saw his livelihood threatened and, and, uh, and, and his, uh, uh, everything, his, his whole life thrown into question by this horrible controversy. Um, and it was a school board. It was these, they were kind of yahoos on the school board who had read a dirty word in a book and, or who had, who had, who had somehow, or who had read a, a flyer from some organization saying that this book was communist or this book was radical or, you know, this book questioned Christian values, that sort of thing. And suddenly the book would be yanked. I was a clean cut young reporter. And, uh, and I started going to, to some rock concerts, some rock concerts at a place called the Fillmore Auditorium, another place called the Avalon Ballroom, and I was seeing these rather amazing rock groups with names like the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and the Quicksilver Messenger Service, and you'd go to these rock dance halls and there were these, there were these amazing, you know, 50-minute, hour-long songs, sets being played, and these liquid light projections on the, on the walls. And uh, and plenty of plenty of uh, chemical help to to uh, to get you into the groove. And um, oh, and I remember at the Fillmore there were there was there were great baskets of free apples for everybody to come and take an apple. And uh, would you like some of my tangerine? Yeah. And uh, and there were there was a there was a there were songs being created almost hourly that resonated so powerfully. There are just anthem after anthem after anthem uh, coming out from, uh, from these groups, from these California groups like the Jefferson Airplane and from Bob Dylan and, and from the Stones and from the Beatles. And it's, it, seemed to be, it seemed to be all over the world. There seemed, to be, there seemed to be some places that it was erupting from especially strongly like London and San Francisco and the Lower East Side of New York. But it would, be, but it would become national almost immediately. There was a feeling that this that this upsurge was, uh, was had a had a had a religious significance, a kind of millennial significance, um, that everything was going to change and change forever, and that people were going to change, and that uh, people were going to love each other, and they were going to they were going to learn how to live together, and uh, that this was this wasn't just people learning to live together, but this was a sort of harmony of the whole universe. We were going to achieve uh, some sort of enlightenment. I mean, this was, this was the view. Um, uh, I don't know how many people really took it seriously. I never quite took it seriously myself, but there were certainly a lot of very articulate, uh, important hippies, artists, uh, mystics, uh, leaders of the time who took it completely seriously. And believed it would change the world forever. And who who certain who believed it would change the world forever? Who believed that who believed that the music uh, the music was not just music was not just something nice to listen to, but was an instrument of global enlightenment. You know that that it was that it was going to that it was going to uh, that it had a, a, a kind of uh, the, the significance of a of a sacred text. Uh, it wasn't just music, and it certainly wasn't business. And it certainly wasn't just a way of getting money or having fun or partying. It was a very, very much more important, uh, serious, and consequential. And then, then you had all the, the characters descend upon the counterculture with their brand new paisley shirts and their love beads and going, you know, peace and love, brother. Uh, would you like to buy one of these?
and uh, and so you had the, that that whole that whole uh, parasite phenomenon uh, coming in to the to the counterculture, and you know it was in all kinds of forms. I mean, initially it wasn't really hippie capitalists. It wasn't so much hippies who 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 uh, who became capitalists. It was capitalists. Uh, dressing up like hippies, um, and in fact, I think from the point of view of the counterculture, there was a, there was a lot of admiration for for some hippie who could who could uh, get rich uh, by making herbal tea or something like that. But some character uh, some character from Madison Avenue who was who was coming in to package uh, you know to package a rock group or to to put out a, a youth magazine. Or something like that. Um, that was seen as a threat to the integrity of the of the whole uh, of the whole movement. You know, the man can't bust our music. Didn't mean just the police. I mean, it also meant uh, Wall Street and Madison Avenue. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, television, uh, the newspapers, uh, everywhere was full of these uh, uh, these very exotic-looking people. You know, with extremely abundant hair. Um, with very peculiar clothes, uh, with um, with with very strange, uh, with very strange, speaking a very uh, curious language, and um, and now it's funny. Now you look back and uh, and it looks incredibly dated. I mean, now if you now you look back at a newsreel or a movie from the 50s, it looks a lot more current than one from the 60s. The the counterculture was just drenched with with eroticism. And uh, even if you leave uh, sexual activity, overt sexual activity, out of it, you had uh, you had an enormous amount of just sensuousness. The very act of having long hair that that blows in the wind and that you can that you can shake and and uh, uh, and that uh, that grows out in pr profusion and it, it, just that is a is 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 an act of sensuality. And if you throw in uh, if you throw in the music, and uh, the sort of uh, uh, the, the the rage for feeling for feeling, uh, the prestige of emotion greatly increased in the in the, in the counterculture and in the '60s, as against the prestige of of thought and intellectuality. Um, so there was an enormously erotic atmosphere. Uh, Created, and then you th then you know, then you add to that the fact that there was a, also an, a, an enormous amount of sex, much more. I think there's no doubt that people were having an awful lot more sex than people of their of the same age had had a decade before. Certainly, certainly in the 50s. Um, I mean, I came, uh, I became interested in girls in the in the middle 50s, and believe me, it was all talk <laughs> until the 1960s. <laughs> I want to read you some specific tenets, and if you could just comment on what the tenet meant in the 60s that reflected on what it was like in the 50s. I'll read you one. Question authority. Uh, it, in the 60s, it meant essentially reject authority. Um, uh, or, or uh, uh, and, the, and the subtext was embrace this new sort of authority, the authority of, of uh, of enlightenment and and uh, the spheres and the music and our own authority, um, it was a it was an anarchist sentiment essentially. Perfect. Do your own thing is another one. Was, these were common phrases. What did do your own thing mean? It meant create yourself. It meant uh, it meant uh, don't fit in to the to the to one of the preset patterns that's been prepared for you. Uh, that's a trap. Uh, that's a game. Uh, invent yourself. Um, uh, be true to yourself. Learn what you want to do and do it. Tell it like it is. What does tell it like it is mean? Um, it means tell it like it is means be truthful. It means forget about the official version. The official version's a lie. Um, find out what the real version is and tell that. Um, everything isn't. Everything isn't okay. Uh, so, so tell it like it really is. Don't tell it like it. Don't tell it like somebody would like it to be. Uh, tell it like it really is. Um, a fairly radical notion at the time. Um, 
all you need is love. Who said that, and what did they oh, really mean that? Well, you know, the Beatles, the Beatles said it, um, but uh, the Beatles were just repeating it. Uh, everybody, was, everybody had been saying it. I mean, everybody who was a hippie. Uh, it meant that 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 um, that love and the harmony of people was going to change everything. And um, of course, that was something that there were that a lot of of uh, more tough-minded radicals, as well as uh, people who could totally outside the counterculture, could see was nonsense. That uh, that, all, that you needed an awful lot more than love. But uh, but when you had millions of people who who actually believed that all you needed was love, some extraordinary things did happen. Um. I am a person, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate. It says something about technology that I'd like you to comment on. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, the, the 50s, the, the mass education that, that was a, a great accomplishment of the 1950s. I mean, this do not fold, spindle, or mutilate uh, it co comes from Berkeley and comes from the University of California and the free speech movement uh, of the very early 60s, of 1962, I guess, 63. And, um, and it means... Um, I'm an individual. I'm not just. I'm not just uh, uh, a standardized category. You know, don't don't uh, don't turn me into a card with a bunch of little holes in it. Um, I'm a human being. I'm a person. I'm me, and I'm unique. And uh, and the the, the 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 it's really a reaction to the mass education of the '50s, which necessarily treated people in categories and in masses and herded them from place to place into huge lecture halls. Um, don't fold or spindle or mutilate me, me. Treat me like a person. I insist on being a person, an individual. Um, yet there also is an anti-technology bent to that. If you could just talk for yeah. a minute about that, I mean that was a factor that's negative, really, about the counterculture. Yeah. Well, it's a factor that was. Uh, th it's a factor that was is certainly now seen as negative about the counterculture. Uh, it remains to be seen whether ultimately it's a negative factor. Certainly, there was a need for a correction in our uh, our society's single-minded worship of technology. And of course, the, the 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 as was as many people noticed at the time, here was uh, here was a group, the hippies, using using um, amplified instruments and and uh, uh, all kinds of technological advances to, a, to advance, to, to put across an anti-technological message. But, uh, but there was um, it, it, part of that, of that anti-technological message uh, was based on a feeling that, um, that the needs of life had been taken care of and that, uh, that, uh, that we weren't going to starve no matter what happened and that we could get along we could get along without so much excess. That money would always be available is what I mean. Money would be available. There'd always be enough to get by. I mean, there'd always be enough so you could get a place to live and something to eat and, you know, and a, and a, and a, and a couple of joints to keep you happy. Um, and uh, that you didn't need so much. I mean, there was a, the, 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 we, this, this side of the 60s and the, the, the whole all you need is love side and the anti-technological side is what's now viewed with the most contempt, I think, and, the, and, and is, is the most ill understood part of the 60s. We can understand the part about, you know, wanting to have justice and equality and civil rights and, and even the anti-war part of it and, and wanting to have some better music than was available uh, earlier, but but all of this uh, idea of, of all the the, the anti-technological aspect of it, um, we just look back on that with puzzlement. It was like who's going to pay the bills is how we we look at it now. The media reacted initially quite positively because this all seemed uh, very benign and it all had to do with love and being colorful and that sort of thing. But rather quickly, uh, it became frightening. Um, I think parents were, were rather justifiably frightened because it looked to them like the complete destruction of any kind of certainty or structure or ambition and that, that, um, that their children were going to get caught up in something that was going to leave them, that was going to leave them helpless uh, 
and bewildered a few years down the road. I think, uh, I think people, I think the parents of daughters were more alarmed than the parents of sons. Um, there was a, and there was certainly a, an overtly anti-parental or kind of war of the generations aspect to all this, where people were people were uh, uh, urged to to reject their parents, and uh, and even if the rejection was basically only verbal, and, or, and a matter of, uh, of of a bit of, of yelling. Uh, and yet, Junior or, or or the daughter was still, you know, didn't drop out of college, and and was still sort of on track to a to a good middle class life later on. The the hurt would still be there, uh, and the f and the fear would still be there. And for those whose for whose children ended up uh, dropping out of school, uh, moving away, living in communes. Uh, taking massive quantities of drugs, uh, speaking in an incomprehensible way. Uh, this was very, very frightening. And, um, and the reaction to the counterculture is at least as powerful a legacy of it as the counterculture itself.